Listen, we are scientifically studying extremely abstract realities. So it is difficult to find terms which allow us to describe with absolute precision and certainty realities that are there. However, this enormous scientific obstacle which we encounter in economics is one we get around, one we overcome, thanks to a huge advantage we enjoy, an advantage other scientists lack. For economics is the only science in which the scientist shares the same nature as those he or she observes. To put it another way, in physics or in chemistry, the physicist or the chemist does not share the same nature as the phenomena he studies. A nuclear physicist is not an atom. He cannot say to himself, I know what atoms do. An atom gets up in the morning, he gets together with another atom and says, come on, let's fuse together. And we fuse together like so, and this fusion sets off a chain reaction and voila, an atomic bomb. No. And a chemist is not a molecule, nor is a biologist a liver. He or she cannot say, I know firsthand what a liver is, where a liver's weaknesses lie, and what a liver feels. No. So in the whole world of the natural sciences, there is a sort of wall that divides the phenomenon observed, the plant, the liver, the atom, the molecule, from the observer. For that reason, the observing scientist has to constantly do laboratory experiments and formulate hypotheses and try to verify them in an attempt to understand, by approximation, something about the natural world. However, in economics, whether you believe it or not, the economic scientist, in this case, me, I am a human being just like you are. Economics is the only science in which the theorist shares the same nature as those he or she observes. And this gives the scientist an enormous advantage, because it gives him first-hand knowledge through introspection, knowledge of the scientific phenomena he is studying. And today, even though it is very difficult and challenging for us to express these highly abstract realities in words, with the restraint our language imposes on us, we are pretty confident because each and every one of us here understands what an end is and understands what value is. The truth is that value, as the subjective appreciation we assign to our end, is a very abstract and complex reality, but nevertheless, we know what we are referring to. Value is, above all, subjective. Think about how I have defined it the subjective appreciation. Notice that there are no suitable terms in Spanish, nor in other languages, for that matter, to refer to value. Appreciation. I have chosen a rough term that incorporates the concept of price. We will talk about prices. All of this I am covering now is to help us understand how prices are determined. We will discuss that a month from now. Anyway, I have little choice of words. I am not going to say value is the subjective, more or less intense value, because then I would be repeating within the definition the word I wish to define. I have been forced to use. I will tell you, sotto voce, so you understand, a very rough term, appreciation but everybody understands subjective, more or less intense. It is like a magnet. There are ends that, that we will do anything to achieve. A mother that wants to save her child. And then there are other ends that we value less, that we appreciate less. I could say, I really like Carmen, but I like Minerva much more. Now, Monica, she is my ideal. These are subjective appreciations, just as with any end a person chooses to pursue. And these appreciations vary in their intensity. Consider the way I have explained this in my example. This appreciation allows us to make comparisons. Values can be compared. I prefer Monica to Minerva and Minerva to Carmen, for example. And I prefer her infinitely or I prefer her strongly, or I prefer her slightly, more 
But what I cannot say, because I cannot measure value in objective terms, is that to me, Monica is worth 3.141516 times what Minerva is worth. Valuations, as psychic appreciations, are part of the subjective internal world, which is not a world we can measure in quantitative terms. It is not a cardinal world, a world of numbers. It is a world of psychic intensities that permits only comparisons. For instance, I like something a lot more, or a little more, or I like something a lot less, or a little less, but we cannot measure this. Furthermore, we determine value subjectively. What do we mean when we say that value is subjective? This is essential. Everybody take note. When I say that value is subjective, what I am indicating is that it is the subject in question, the person who is acting, who determines the value. This is what subjective means. Thus, value can never be objectively determined by an outside observer. This is key. Eh? I repeat, value is subjective, in the sense that it is the subject, this is where the term comes from, subject, subjective, who determines or assesses the value in the context of each action he or she undertakes but it cannot be measured from the outside in objective terms.